Dr. Sharona, to have this time with you is very precious to me. So thank you for taking time. Well, Eric, it's my honor. Great to be with you. My, my first question for you is, you've walked with God for many years. What has kept you faithful to the Lord all these years? Um, I didn't start this. God did. You know, the, the, the fact that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. This December, um, I celebrate 50 years walking with Christ and 50 years preaching the gospel. So within three weeks of my conversion and being filled with the Spirit, I led my entire musical group to Christ. We began to do concerts. I began to preach. And I've been all around the world, but um, I didn't start this. Grace, you know, um, John Wesley, who is indeed the source and origin of Pentecostal holiness, He's our roots. I'm a Wesleyan Pentecostal, died in the wool. When I got filled with the Holy Ghost and I ended up going to a church in Brooklyn, it was deeply uh, seated in the Wesleyan Pentecostal tradition. And for John Wesley, grace is always prior. You know, we talk about it as prevenient grace before we get saved, which is an aspect of what Wesley talked about. However, when Wesley said grace is always prior, he's saying in every area of our life, Everything that happens is because grace is at work in our life. So I can't, I can't say, Eric, the reason I keep walking with God is, because I can tell you I've made decisions, I've persevered, but all of that is because the one who called me has been faithful. And if I get in trouble, he knows how to take me out to the woodshed and remind me, <laughs> you, you really do need me in your life. So I'm a dysfunctional Italian from New York. That profound brokenness is still there, but he's taking it slowly and attempting to make it more beautiful. I don't know how well uh, he thinks that's going. I'll find out when I die, but you know, the brokenness and the beauty is still commingled. So every once in a while, the dysfunctional Italian from New York still comes out. And my wife has to help me uh, know the way of God more perfectly when that happens. How oh, beautiful. <laughs> In walking with God through uh -huh. ministry for 50 years, what kind of advice would you give to younger ministers. Yeah, you know, when I first came to Jesus, now I was raised in a Presbyterian setting and growing up as, a, and I was a musician, so I loved music and I wanted to be an entertainer. So that my whole conversion experience comes out of my pursuit of the entertainment world. And because I'm Italian, there was a certain way in which I knew if I couldn't make it big on my talent, I could make it big on certain connections that could open doors if I just was willing to pay the price. I'm trying to be really careful how I say all this, but I mean, I, you know, I just, so I, I've got I've got a portion of my story that's tied to um, all that kind of stuff. And God, God saved me from a lot of sorrow. But growing up Presbyterian, I remember um, I remember all the hymns that um, I heard as a kid. And when I came to Christ, uh, that earliest moment of, it was two o'clock in the morning, December 23rd, 1973. The reason I remember the date, it was, it was maybe two days prior that one of my heroes had just died, Bobby Darren, the famous singer, who was slated to be the next Frank Sinatra. Um, died on an operating table at 38 years old of um, uh, because of coronary artery disease. And even though the, the operation was somewhat successful, back then they hadn't perfected it to the way they have now. He died on the table. And I, and I grieved his loss because I loved the way he could sing. I loved the way he could put a song over. He was the consummate entertainer. And everybody said he was the heir apparent to Frank Sinatra. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, I was, and I had a band, and I was, we were getting ready to make some major connections with, um, with the, the big connections in New York and Vegas, and um, my drummer was a Jesus freak, and he was letting me know in no uncertain terms that my goals were perverted and selfish, and that if I kept pursuing that, I was going to hell, and I said, I'm a good Presbyterian, I'm not going to hell. <laughs> Anyway, at two o'clock that morning, I had a radical encounter with Jesus in my bedroom. Um, and at the time, I had 
Jesus Christ Superstar was on Broadway. Now, Jeff Fenholt was the lead singer. Now, years later on TBN, I got to know Jeff personally. We became close personal friends. So, you know, but it's interesting back then. So, so I had, I had a, I had a, a neon black light Jesus Christ Superstar sign that glowed in the dark with, you know, the neon lights and uh, the black light. And um, I had a radical encounter with Jesus and I was up all night, but in the morning, that old hymn, and I say, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Be my glory ever. There my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. And Eric, I can tell you for years and years and years, the one little grace that any time I have had these temptations to now, I know scripture now in a way I didn't know back then, but but that one psalm would come to my heart. Jesus, mm. keep me near the cross. Be my glory ever. There my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. And so it was those little things that kept coming back from my early days of investment, the investment of grace before I knew about it, of the cross-shaped life. And... It's grace that's kept me at the cross because the cross isn't easy because it's like, yeah, Lord, isn't there an easier way to get to where we want to be? Just leave, leave me alone in this area. Don't pick on this. Don't. But, you know, again, it's Jesus, keep me near the cross. I, I you know, there's and I almost sound like a broken record these days because I speak a lot about the cross shaped life, cruciformity as the brilliant theologian Michael Gorman wrote a whole book on cruciformity. Your your young readers would benefit from getting Michael Gorman, G-O-R-M-A-N, get his book on cruciformity in the teachings of St. Paul. Um, it, it It is life-changing, and it's so true. I don't want anything new. I want true. I don't need anything. I don't need a new revelation. I need true revelation. And Jesus is the truth. The truth is a person. So, you know, when I grew up in the in in the era of education being tied to modernity. So now we're in post-modernity. But in modernity, in the Enlightenment, truth was relative. All truth is relative. It's your truth. It's my truth. Well, truth is relative. He's my elder brother. His name is Jesus, and he's personal. He's truth. And so for me, the truth as it is in Jesus is what really matters. That's what keeps me. But again, it's him. I, I can't take any credit. Yes, I respond. Yes, I say yes. But even that yes that I say, I know it's because he's gracious and not because I'm somebody special. So the advice, I don't know if that helps or not. But. Oh, definitely. So it, to pull it all together, your advice to the younger generation is to stay near the cross and yeah. come into a cruciformity. Yeah. crucified life with Christ. Praise God. What Galatians 2.20 is the summation of the entire New Testament narrative. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which, so now I've got an I and a me, and yet this deeper I. So like the the me that you that I know subject, objectively, uh, subjectively, the me that eats breakfast that's the the conscious me, but the deeper me in Christ, the imago dei, the me I'm becoming, that me is far different than the me I show up as when I am less than perfect. And I won't be the true me, the I, the image of God, until this corruption puts on incorruption and I I behold him, then as I, I will be like him because I will see him as he is. I'm on that journey right now, so I see a little better than I did 50 years ago, but not much, just a little bit. So you've seen so much happen in ministry all these years. Mm -hmm. What kind of cautions would you give to ministers? Okay. Um, you know, Eric, these are, these are actually very profound questions and I, I don't, I, and I know I, I have been, I, some people have said, Sharona, you have the ability to take the simple and make it amazingly complex. And, and yet for me, these are very deep questions because if I'm going to know the height, the depth, the breadth and the width of Christ. Right? So when Paul says in Colossians, I pray that you know the height, the depth, the breadth, and the width, 
and the love that surpasses comprehension. So height, so we think of the four corners of the compass, but height has to do with how far you can reach into the eternity of God and how deep the eternity of God goes. And breadth and width and length is all the way back to the earliest beginnings of human history to the consummation of history. He encompasses it all, right? So if he's going to have the preeminence, <laughs> then what I need to remember is that no matter what I see or what I think I've seen, and, and Eric, I have seen things that I never expected to see in terms of signs, wonders, miracles. I've been on every continent on this planet. I have preached to tens of thousands of people in certain settings and on television back in the heyday on any given night within 24 hours 40 million people had seen my face three or four nights a week i would get eight to ten million hits on my website that all can really inflate your ego if you don't stay close to the cross and so i'm going to just get back to keeping it very simple Christ is so far beyond our knowing that even when I think I know something, I need to plead something. I just wrote a 13,000 word article that I'm hoping will be published in one of the Pentecostal academic journals called Sacred Ignorance. <laughs> the desperate need in our generation for sacred ignorance. So when, Eli so when Ezekiel, um, and I I'm trying to answer your question the way I'm hearing it in terms of how I would process it. If you had asked me this 30 years ago, I would have given you a different answer. But at 69 years old, 50 years celebrating my birthday in Jesus, um, this is how I'm going to answer that now in terms of how do, how do you navigate all this based on everything you've seen. So when Ezekiel is taken in a vision into the valley of dry bones, right? What he actually sees there is as horrific or worse than any Stephen King horror movie you would ever see. I mean, it's we, we water it down and don't look at the graphic nature of what he's seeing. And he's traumatized by it. Um, if we look at his responses to God with a discerning eye and look at how he works out, how he communicates what he sees in all his visions, Ezekiel is profoundly traumatized by what he sees. So when the Lord says, can these bones live? For all he's prophesied so far, Ezekiel pleads sacred ignorance. Lord, you know. And the moment we claim we have revelation, we're in trouble. And I would argue that if you really do have revelation, the more humble you're going to be and the more you're going to say, I have a sense of this. You're not going to say, the Lord told me this, the Lord. We need to stop acting as if we have a direct pipeline to God and everything we hear is perfect because everything we hear is filtered through our humanness. It's one of the reasons Paul says, let the spirit of the prophet be subject to the prophet. That's more than just knowing when to shut up. What Paul is talking about there is personal subjectivity, imperfection, and the need to realize that we only know so much and we don't know it all. And he was correcting the pride and arrogance of the Corinthians who were puffed up thinking that because they moved in the gifts, they had arrived. They actually thought the resurrection had already come and they were already perfected. So we want to use Corinthians to teach people how to move in the gifts. Paul was using Corinthians to say, you guys need to take a lot of humble pills and realize you don't know anywhere near what you think you know. And love, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And so the more we know, the less we know. And um, so I think the way we need to navigate is that even when we claim we have revelation, we need to be <laughs> extremely guarded in how we speak about it. Because what I say today 10 years from now is going to be so different because I'm growing. I'm on, my, I'm on my journey. I'm not there yet. So even when I speak with authority, I'm not Jesus. I'm a human that is being and becoming more and more like Jesus. Um, but that takes time. So summarizing this, it, it seems like you're saying your caution to ministers is pride. Yes. Well, hubris, and it's always been hubris. This all, you know, the early fathers, Evagrius Ponticus, the famous yeah. ascetic father from the, you know, from the 400s. He's the first one that talked about the deadly sins. Now he had eight 
And then some of the other fathers says, well, we can combine these two and make them one so that there were seven deadly sins. But there was an early psycho spirituality, spiritual psychology in those seven deadly sins that we end up dismissing today when in actual fact they are profoundly important for the health and well-being of the psyche. But all of those seven deadly sins, or the eight, if we start with Evagrius, if we separate out vainglory from the other, um, are rooted in hubris and pride. And um, you got to remember that by the, by the time we get to the fourth century, all the Greek mythologies um, and the Roman mythologies barred from the Greek, all of them had some one of the myths about pride going before a fall. So it wasn't just the Hebrew culture that understood pride goes before a fall. The Greek culture, the Bible, all of them had myths about figures that were inflated with hubris. And uh, out of that ego inflation, they had a great fall. And so, yeah, pride is the, it's the killer. It's the killer. It's it, And today in psychology, we would call it ego inflation. And so when I've got a really big ego, um, I'm a really less than human person. But when my ego is sublimated at the cross <laughs> and Christ is evident in me, <laughs> God fills the room and not me. Wow. The goal is for God to fill the room, not me. Because I can't fill the room, I'm not God. But if I can, if I can stay in a place of humility and quietude and speak as it were the oracle of God, which is Christ, preaching Christ and him crucified, he'll fill the room and do things through me that I could never do by myself. Because apart from him, I can do nothing. Let me ask you this. In a nutshell, what is it that the Lord has been saying to Dr. Sharona at this time? Oh, to me at, at, at 69 years old, um, you know, Eric, if you had asked me when I was 40, what, what is God saying to you? I'd have had a 20 year plan laid out for you because I was in that season of life. I had, you know, when, when, um, I'll, can I back into this one as well? Is that okay? Because I'm just, this is how I think. So, you know, it, it may sound like, well, can't you just get to the point? I've learned to slow down to the speed of revelation. We move too fast. When I, in my generation, one of the big famous songs was the 59th Street Bridge song. Now, you may not know that until you hear it. Slow down, you move too fast. Got to make the morning last. Just kicking around the cobblestones, looking for fun and feeling groovy. Hello, lamppost, what you know, and came to watch the flowers growing. I mean, slow down, you move too fast. That's a word God has ingrained in me post my dark season from which I wrote the book On the Edge of Hope back um, a year and a half ago based on that four painful years from 2007 to 2011 where I preferred death to life. So for me, everything slows down. So listen carefully. So here's, I'm gonna, I'll, give, I'll show you a case in point of how when I think about where am I right now, as compared to where I was at 40 or 30 or what I would consider the prime of my life. We know this passage. Hast thou not seen, hast thou not heard, right? That the Lord, the mighty one, neither grows weary nor tired. His, his, uh, his understanding is unsearchable. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So watch, you've got three categories. Youths, well, well, in the Hebrew, what is the age range of youths? Well, that begins somewhere at adolescence, but it goes through almost 30 to 35 years old. Vigorous young men is between the ages of, it's midlife, 35 to 65. They that wait upon the Lord are the third category, because we don't slow down until we're old enough to have the, the stuffing knocked out of us, and we walk with the cross and of you know, James and John are the sons of thunder. Um, and James gets taken out first, martyred first. John gets to live the longest, but he doesn't become the apostle of love overnight. He wants to call fire down from heaven when he wants to sit on the throne. But at the end of his life, it's my little children, let's love one another. Youths grow weary and tired. Vigorous young men stumble badly. So, But it's part of a season we go through because we're driven. We've got energy. We've got dreams. We've got goals. Old, young men, young women dream dreams. Old men, old women uh, young men and young women see visions. Old men and old women dream dreams because they, they have more 
they have more realities behind them than dreams ahead of them, but they're dreaming for the next generation, not for themselves. So waiting on the Lord takes time. So again, if you were to ask me, what is God saying to me at this season of my life? If you would ask me that when I was 40, I'd have given you a 20 or a 25 year plan, honestly. And I could do, I could do it in my sleep. But at this season of my life, I'm in a territory without maps. I feel like Moses on the backside of the desert, um, waiting for direction from God. And it's really okay. Um, the uncertainty is okay. I'm uncomfortable not knowing. I wouldn't have been comfortable at 20. I wouldn't have been comfortable at 30. But at 69, about to enter my 70th year, um, it's okay for me not to know. So I'm in a territory without maps. And Midbar, which is the wilderness, is tied in the Hebrew to Davar, which is the word of the Lord. Midvar, Davar. So it's in a territory without maps that we're really open to hearing what God has to say because we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So I'm probably in the best place I could be to actually hear God say something fresh to me. Oh, that's incredible. So there's people watching. Mm -hmm. There'll be mothers watching. There'll be ministers watching. There'll be students watching, blue collar workers all kinds of different people. If you could look into the camera mm -hmm. and talk to them and sure. give them some piece of encouragement, what would you say? Yeah, you know, I would say, first of all, beloved, because God calls us beloved, we are beloved in Christ. The Father is our eternal refuge. God is our dwelling place. So as the late theologian Robert W. Jensen would say, God is a place all by himself. God is our home, beloved. And so in Deuteronomy, when Moses at the end of his life says, the eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, Irenaeus, the spiritual grandson of John the beloved, said the Father has two hands, the Son and the Spirit. So the God and Father who is our eternal home Underneath us are the arms of the Son and the Spirit. No matter how deep or dark we feel the season is we're in, deeper still are the Son and the Spirit who are catching us up into the embrace and the love of a God who will never let us go, from whom we will never be separated, and who knows us better than we know ourselves. And in an hour when everything that can be shaken is being shaken and when culture wars are rife and social media is filled even with christians spewing vile things in the name of christ that sound more hateful and demonic than they do they do loving if you're wrestling with all that and you want the opposite you want to know what it means to be human god the father through christ and the spirit is drawing you up by the Spirit and into Christ to learn how to be and become more truly who he intended you to be as a human being that embraces their brokenness and vulnerability along with the beauty of who he's making you in Christ. And so learn how not to be so shocked by your imperfections, but in weakness learn to glory in the one who is your strength. God is up to something in our day that I would say that the same thing he said to Habakkuk the prophet, you wouldn't believe me if I told you because we're so used to bad news these days. But God is grooming a people for a fresh awareness and an awakening of the one who was and is and is about to arrive in a fresh way so that the Spirit wants to gladden our eyes to see him who is beyond seeing and to begin to discern him on our Emmaus road to our perfecting. And Emmaus, the Emmaus road where Jesus walked with his uncle Cleopas, and it was his Aunt Mary, uh, by the way, but G Luke does, says it's the unnamed disciple because Luke wants you to see yourself on that road and how hard it is for you and I to discern the presence of Jesus when we're going through so many difficult things and yet allow Jesus to draw out of us our pain and process it in speech because prayer brings everything to speech. 
so that when we get to where we're going, no matter how dark it gets, and Jesus looks like he's going to go further, something in us says, I want you to stay with me. I want you to abide with me. Lord Jesus, I want you to be where I am. And so he comes in. But when he sits at the table, even though he's the guest, he becomes the host. He turns the table, he becomes the host, and he takes the bread. This is the end of the sermon. He takes the bread, he lifts it up before his father, he blesses it, he breaks it. Their eyes are opened, and he vanishes, not from their presence, but from their sight. The loaves drop, and they realize we have been with Jesus. He's weaning them away from all physical dependencies on whether he's with them or not, and teaching them prior to Pentecost how to discern him by the probings, the nudges, the questions, the wrestlings, and to recognize him and how he takes us, he blesses us, he breaks us, so he can give us his bread to the people we're called to serve. Our children, our grandchildren, the emerging generations, those outside of Christ that need to feed on him and drink of him by feeding on you and drinking of you. I pray you have a blessed, blessed journey in this season. God is up to something good and he is a place all by himself and you are where he is. Let him live big, as Marilyn Hickey says, in you. Praise God. Thank you so much for the time, the wisdom, the spiritual impartation that we've received today. How can they get your books and your YouTube channel, all this kind of stuff? Just tell them. Yeah, so all of my books are on Amazon. The newest one, On the Edge of Hope, which is about my dark season, they can get it on audiobook, they can get it on Kindle, they can get it in hardback, and they get the hardback edition is a high gloss, it's really pretty, but that's on my dark season. I've probably written over 20 books. You can get all of them on Amazon. Um, the new book, The Devotional, is coming out. I think you can pre-order it on Amazon. It's the devotional to the On the Edge of Hope about coping with painful, afflictive emotions. Um, MarkSharona.com is my website. And then I think I'm just at Mark Sharona on YouTube. Um, I've got a podcast that's on iTunes. So if they just Google me, they, they, they should find me somewhere. Great, great. Again, thank you so much. You're more than welcome, Eric. You're more than welcome.